you'll turn in your Bibles to the book of Acts. Acts chapter 7. Acts chapter 7. We're going to pick up in verse 17 and work our way through verse 26. Let's go to the Lord in prayer. Father, this is your word, and we ask that you move through it, Lord, that your Holy Spirit brings it to our minds, that gives us clarity in our minds and our thoughts and our actions. Lord, everything that we're we're about this morning, we ask for that clarity of the Holy Spirit to speak to us. We pray that we hear your word in, in our own language that we understand it, that we apply it to our lives. God, we ask that you speak to us right now. In Jesus' name, amen. Now, last week, we saw Stephen point to the patriarchs' rejection of their brother Joseph and their reconciliation that came right after that or, or later on. And then finally, it led to these patriarchs moving to Egypt. There can be no mistake here of Stephen's point that the beginning of the Jewish people was one of immediate rejection of a type or a clear type of Christ, that being Joseph. Now, if you missed last week, it's online. Please, please, I'm going to ask, I'm going to beg you to go back and listen to that. You do not want to miss last week's sermon, and that's what's so wonderful about them being online, is you don't have to miss them. And I even went back this week and watched it again, and I'd preached it all week long, and I think it's a powerful sermon. I don't have time to go back through and show how Joseph was a clear type of Christ, but he was, you can see that he was rejected immediately by his brothers. Eventually, he was reconciled to them. He brought all of those brothers, his family, into Egypt. You can see there how they, so to speak, reigned with Joseph in Egypt, just as we will reign with Christ. There's a clear connection, a parallel between uh, Joseph and Christ. And, And the point that Stephen is making here, and it's hard to see that point as we're taking a few verses every week, but I want you to see the bigger picture. I wish we could do all this at once, but it just doesn't work out that way, and so I'm having to to bring it together and make the point each week that Stephen is clearly trying to make here that the patriarchs, from the very beginning, they are rejecting a Savior sent to them. The very name that Pharaoh changed Joseph's name to means Savior of the world. He was a Savior of the world, and he was rejected by his own. So again, please go back and watch that Uh, that sermon, uh, I think that you will find it uh, quite interesting. But in our passage today, Stephen will approach one of the central characters in all of Hebrew history, Moses, a man whose name shone so bright in the Jewish firmament with a brightness that could only be rivaled by that of Abraham. First, I want us to notice uh, that the Hebrews... I want us to notice the Hebrews' reaction, their reaction to Moses, the very one who would eventually deliver them from Egypt. Verses 17 through 36 will give us their reaction. We're only going to deal with 17 through 26 this morning, so we have a part one, and next week we'll have a part two, so please come back for that. But first, I want us to notice here the fearful bondage of Israel. The first part of verse 17 gives the time. So look at that verse with me. As the time was drawing near to fulfill the promise that God had made to Abraham. God does things according to set times. He never forgets a date. He never misses an appointment. There are set times predetermined in heaven in which God acts. When we study the scriptures, we need not miss that. We need to grasp that as we study through scripture. When God created the sun and the moon, he ordained that they might be for signs, they might be for seasons, according to Genesis 1, 14, 
and deliberately God introduced a time factor into human affairs. Thus the sun governs our days and our years and the moon divides the months, uh, divides them into months. Jesus, after his resurrection, remained here 40 days and at his ascension he told the disciples to wait for the coming of the Holy Spirit not many days from now, according to Acts 1.5. Nothing was hurried beyond its time. So we see here in our passage that the years of the Egyptian exile ran their course. As the time drew near for the prophecy to be fulfilled, God made the first of his moves. And it was not one that anyone would have expected had it not already been foretold to Abraham in Genesis 15. The time was drawing near. Now the second part of verse 17 and verse 18 give the tension. So there's tension here. There's a time that's coming, but there's also tension within this. It says here in verse 17, the people flourished and multiplied in Egypt until a different king who did not know Joseph ruled over Egypt. There came a change of dynasties here. A new regime came to power and the throne was occupied by a new pharaoh. Biblical historians are divided as to who this pharaoh actually was. Those who espouse the theory of a late date or late exodus believe that it was Ramesses II. Those who hold to the theory of an early exodus believe that it was Thutmose I. But the rapid multiplication of the Hebrews in Goshen naturally caused great alarm among the Egyptians. A few Hebrews would have made no difference to them, but their numbers began to climb into the millions. And so the Egyptians began to view the Hebrews with greater alarm. Tensions began to build. The question arose in the minds of these Egyptians, what if these Hebrews ally with one of our enemies. The fact also that the Hebrews uh, were shepherds added further to the fear here of the Egyptians, memories of the Hyksos, and this was an Asian group. Uh, they were shepherd kings, and they came in, and they ruled Egypt for 150 years. And so you can imagine here what the Egyptians are thinking. They're thinking, okay, we have these shepherds here, and they are gaining in number. They are getting in the millions. And we are afraid of them. We have memories of uh, the Hyksos who came in and ruled us for 150 years. They took over our kingdom. We don't want to see that same thing happen by these Hebrews who are also shepherds. And so there's tension here. There is great fear. Verse 19 gives the terror that resulted from the tension Verse 19, he dealt deceitfully, and this being Pharaoh, with our race and oppressed our ancestors by making them leave their infants outside so they wouldn't survive. Pharaoh's solution to what Hitler later called the Jewish solution or the Jewish question was along the same lines. It was genocide, the systematic murder of a race. Goshen became the ghetto, the Nile River was Pharaoh's gas chamber. The crocodiles was his means of disposing of the bodies. Pharaoh's plans were longer range than that of Hitler, but they were just as effective. Every male Hebrew born from the date of the decree was to be cast into the river. It's hard to think of a reign of terror uh, that would be more heartless than this. Having your baby son ripped from your arms by Pharaoh's Gestapo and flung living or dead into the river, into the Nile. But such was this fearful bondage that Israel was going through. So with a few brief words here, Stephen has set the stage for another uh, of Israel's uh, times of rejection of their saviors. So what's happening here is the Hebrews are increasing in number. Joseph has gone to, has, has taken uh, his people, he's taken the Hebrew people to Egypt. And they're there and they're doing well, they're thriving there, and now they're growing into the millions. And great fear has come upon the Egyptians. And as that fear grows, uh, it turns into a radical step by the Pharaoh, by the Egyptians, to, 
try to annihilate basically a generation of the Israelites. And so we come to a point that we need some kind of a savior here. So next we will see Israel's foolish bigotry. Verse 20 reveals the Savior's birth. It says in verse 20, at this time Moses was born and he was beautiful in God's sight. He was cared for in his father's home for three months. Jochebed, the mother of Moses, decides to make an attempt to rescue her son from the clutches of this evil plan by Pharaoh. Maybe she remembered Noah and his ark. Noah had gone right through the judgment waters, safe in the ark of God's provision. Now, Jochebed makes a little ark. She puts Moses in and puts uh, the ark in the judgment water, and she calls on God to honor her faith. Note what Stephen says in verse 20. He says that Moses was beautiful, beautiful in God's sight. He was an extraordinarily good-looking child, one can hardly imagine Pharaoh's daughter being too very interested in an extremely ugly baby. It seems that Moses was beautiful. It caught the attention of Pharaoh's daughter, and she takes him in. Verses 21 and 22 reveal the Savior's background. It says, And when he was left outside, Pharaoh's daughter adopted and raised him as her own son. So Moses was educated in all the wisdom of the Egyptians and was powerful in his speech and his actions. So Moses was hidden at home for three months, and when it was no longer possible to hide him, he was left outside, he was placed in this little ark or this little basket, and then later found by Pharaoh's daughter, adopted by her, raised as her own son. Stephen tells us that Moses was educated in all the wisdom of the, the Egyptians. So Pharaoh's daughter had her adopted son groomed for the throne to which doubtless she would have elevated him had he not surrendered to the call of God later on. She would have elevated him to uh, the most powerful man and to Pharaoh uh, over Egypt. He gave up the throne though. And we're not to that point yet, but we'll get to that point. He gave up the throne to step down to Israel's need, as did our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Do you see the parallel here? Moses had everything, everything going for him. I mean, not, not very first, it seems, but, you know, again, he's a little baby. He doesn't know what's going on, and his mother is trying to save his life, and she places him out there in that little ark, that little uh, little basket, I guess you could call it, that's been weaved together, and places him there. Well, Pharaoh's daughter sees Moses, sees that he's beautiful, and she takes him in, and she raises him in Pharaoh's court. Now think about the difference here. He could have been raised by an Egyptian. It could have been someone other than Pharaoh's daughter. And maybe he would have got a really good education, but he was raised in Pharaoh's court. If Egypt's the most powerful nation on the face of the earth, where else are you going to get a better education? And then if you are the elitist in that country, you're going to get the best education possible. So he is raised with all of the wisdom and the power of Egypt. So you see what Moses had. And eventually he would probably take over the throne, most likely. But he leaves all of that. He leaves that to go redeem his people. Now, who does that sound like? Sounds like Jesus Christ. Seeing the very nature of God. Left his throne. Came down to this earth. Walked this earth like a man. Like us. Like people. For us. Set an example. Died on a cross. For the very beings that he created. Redeemed. To redeem them. Moses. The parallels, you can't miss them. Between him being a savior there and Jesus Christ, of course, being the savior of the world. Stephen also tells us that Moses was powerful in his speech and his actions. Moses was mighty in words. When God called him to become Israel's redeemer or kinsman redeemer, Moses replied, I am not eloquent. Exodus 4.10. 
But that was after he had spent 40 years in the desert solitude. Perhaps he was referring to the Egyptian language, which he had probably not spoken much, not being in Egypt anymore. Or perhaps the reference, powerful in speech, is to his writing skills, which were certainly of a high caliber. His eloquence is evident on all, in all of his writings, never more so than in the book of Deuteronomy, which contains tens of, ten of his magnificent monologues. He was also powerful in action. Josephus, the Jewish historian, has it that while a member of Pharaoh's court, that Moses led a campaign against the Ethiopians. So he's powerful in speech. He's also powerful in actions. In any case, Moses, like Jesus, increased in wisdom and in stature. He acquired the ability and the discipline necessary for the great ministry of becoming the Savior to his people. So we see here the Savior's background. Next, Stephen reveals the Savior's brethren. Look at verses 23 through 25 and the manifestation of the Savior. It says, as he was approaching the age of 40, he decided to visit his brothers, the Israelites. When he saw one of them being mistreated, he came to his rescue and avenged the oppressed man by striking down the Egyptian. He assumed his brothers would understand that God would give them deliverance through him, but they did not understand. Please take note of that. But they did not Understand, the Hebrews in Egypt were blind to the redemptive purposes of God in the birth and the background of Moses. They were envious of him and his position that he occupied in life compared with theirs. They could not see that he had been set apart for them to be their savior. Stephen says they did not understand with obvious application to the sad parallel being reenacted in Israel by the Jews of Stephen's day. Jesus, by birth and background, was set apart from his countrymen by physical descent, according to Romans 9.3. By virtue of his essential position in life as God's son, they did not understand. Blindness, as the apostle would put it later, happened to Israel. You can't miss the parallel there. However, Moses, when the moment came... He identified himself with the oppressed people. He decided to go and visit his brothers by the power, I believe, of the Holy Spirit. This was not just a passing thought that came into Moses' head. This was a yearning that came into Moses' heart. Redemption, after all, is the thought of God's heart toward us. It was not curiosity that took Moses from the palace to Goshen. It was kinship. He wanted to be identified with his brethren so much that he struck a blow for them against their oppressors. It was also that the Lord Jesus, in the fullness of time, identified himself with Adam's ruined race in the waters of Jordan and then went into the wilderness to strike a death blow to Satan. Now look at verse 26 and the meditation of the Savior The next day he showed up while they were fighting and tried to reconcile them peacefully, saying, Men, you are brothers. Why are you mistreating each other? Moses wanted his countrymen to know that God had not only raised him up to be their kinsman, redeemer, but also to bring them peace. The petty squabbles of that downtrodden people grieved him greatly. He sought to bring them peace reconciliation but his ministry was regarded as meddling when Jesus came he found the children of Israel in just such a state the nation was torn by warring factions the Pharisees the Sadducees the Zealots the Herodians the Essenes they were all at odds with each other and were all under the heel of Rome the great oppressor Jesus came preaching peace in the Sermon on the Mount he taught a loftier way of life he said blessed are the poor in spirit blessed are the meek blessed are the merciful blessed are the peacemakers Matthew 5 Christ's message also fell on deaf ears as Moses' message had fell also 
Moses had a message to the people. He came out showing them that he was a redeemer. He was going to set them free, or at least he thought they were going to see this, and they don't see it. And of course, if you go on forward, they don't even see it after he takes them out of Egypt. They still complain. They still bicker against him. Moses has come to not only redeem them, but bring them peace. Now, Jesus Christ, what did he come for? came to bring us peace, the peace between God and man. Colossians 1.20 says, by making peace through the blood of his cross. Now, if you have never made peace through the blood of Christ's cross, then you can't truly understand peace. Jesus said, I give peace that the world doesn't know. It doesn't give. There's a peace between you and God. The Bible says that if you're not saved, if you've never trusted in Christ, you've never come to peace with Christ, it says you're at enmity with God. That means you're at war with God. There's no peace between you and the Lord. Jesus said, I'm the way, the truth, and the life. The way of what? The way of peace between man and God. If you found that peace between you and God, you found the Prince of Peace, as Isaiah 9, 6 says. Then it's possible that you live in peace with others. Romans 12, 18 says, if possible, on your part, live at peace with everyone. So if we're called to be at peace with God, then we're also called to be at peace with one another. How many times do we war and squabble? Do we fight each other? Do we pick on each other? Do we laugh at each other, mock each other, bicker behind each other's backs? No peace. Not understanding that those who are born of the Prince of Peace should live out peace in their life. How often that's not happened. Of course, in Galatians, we know one of the fruit of the Spirit is peace. Love, joy, peace. So to understand this morning that if you are redeemed, if you are born of God, that you are at peace with God now. And if you're at peace with God, then you're to be at peace with others. The Bible talks about living at peace with everyone as much as possible. And that's talking about everyone. That's not just talking about other believers. As much as it's up to you, is what it says, live at peace with everyone. It's not always possible. I know that. I understand that. But that's supposed to be what we strive for. It says in Psalm 37, 37, Watch the blameless and observe the upright, for the man of peace will have a future. And actually that can be defined as prosperity. The man of peace will have Prosperity. Now, don't always think about riches and gold and money. Prosperity, what is real prosperity? It is having the Lord in your life and being transformed. Watch the blameless. Observe the upright, for the man of peace will have a future. Now, why should we live at peace with one another? What's the point of it? Well, first of all, the Bible commands us to. You have no choice if you're a believer. You're commanded to live at peace with one another. But also, how do we set an example for those around us? How do we set an example for Binkelman and the surrounding area? Because let me tell you, they're not living at peace with one another. I see it all the time. I see this person putting this person down and this person cursing this person. It's constant. I see it constant. It's the great thing about Facebook, isn't it? You get to see everybody's business. And for some odd reason, some people don't know any better than to put all their business up on Facebook. And they put it up there, and you see them bickering, fighting, fussing. But how can you have peace if you don't know Christ? You can't. And so it's always about yourself. It's about me first. What did they do for me, or what did they not do for me? And when we live like that, We're never going to live in peace. But we, as the body of Christ, those who are Christians, 
believers, born again, trusted in Christ alone for their salvation. We are called to set an example of peace. We're called to show people how to love one another. To show them the peace of Christ, the Prince of Peace in our life. Are we setting that example? I'm afraid often you would have to say no. We're not. We're living divisive lives. And I don't know if you know what God's word says about a divisive person. It says God hates a divisive person. I can't think of anything worse than that to think that God hates me. We don't want to be divisive people. We don't want to stir the pot. You ever heard someone say, I'm going to stir the pot. Now, that's okay if we're stirring it by preaching God's word in the right attitude. Please understand me. You can preach God's word in the wrong attitude. I know that. And stir the pot. But if you preach it in the right attitude, sometimes you are going to stir the pot. But too often, I think we're stirring the pot to upset other people, make people mad, to to discredit people, to hurt people. That should not be named among a believer. Moses wanted to bring peace to his nation. Jesus wanted to bring peace to his people. We should want to bring peace amongst each other. Let that be the call of our lives. I believe we have a final song, a final hymn. The front's always open if you want to come and pray. Uh, If you will stand with us this morning.